And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, as always, I have my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. We are back to, once again. Once, once again. Just a note: uh, Zadari Enterprises has closed their uh, guinea. I mean, um, test pilot candidacies at this time. Uh, we are fully staffed, so uh, you missed your chances, guys. You know what they say about snoozing and losing. Yeah, eventually I just take all of the positions and test all the robots myself. I mean, what? <laughs> but. We, but we are back once again with a, with a look at another class in the in the in the playtest version of Heavens and Heresies. Um, either playtest or early access, potato potato. But and this time around, we're doing the rogue. Now, unlike last week, the rogue is not necessarily a problem class. Be kind of hard for it to be, given that it's one of the original four. But I have a I have a weird paradox with this with this particular class and my history with it. I I don't have I I don't have as much of an issue with the class itself as I do a lot of the people who play it. This largely ha this largely has to do with the fact that the fantasy of the rogue of the of the expert thief safe cracker or what have you is is one that lends itself very easily to some to somebody being a solo act especially especially since given their given their particular school skill set is exclusive to them granted a little less so nowadays but ver but still very much so it's very easy for them to for them to fo for them to focus on their thief on their thieving stuff independently of the rest of the party um if I were to use an, if I were to use another example, consi consider the hacker archetype in a cyberpunk game, and how the hacking system is its own separate thing from the from what the rest of the party is doing. This is probably why hacking is one of those things that nobody's really got a hundred percent right in um, cyberpunk RPGs. Yeah, they're doing the best they can with what they have. Of course. Acknowledging that that uh, rogues can do the one man band if they have to, um, they also have various different uh, subtypes they can dip into or or prestiges they could train into depending on where where you are and which edition you're looking at, um, so that you can either be Mister uh, Stabby McSneak Sneak, or you can be Mister edgy McKill kill because of the assassination stuff yeah there's definitely that there's definitely that whereas and the, nor, and uh, normally I'd be for, I'd be perfectly fine with a wide amount of variance when it comes when it comes to a given class when it comes to a given class um, it is a bit of a problem when the when those variances get a little bit too wide and it largely it I'd say it largely has to do with the with the fact that the rogue ha the rogue has had the reputation as the skill monkey in a system in a system that has never done a very that does not have a very good history with skill systems. And whenever I bring this up, I u I usually get a few grogs saying what saying that saying he ha saying he's had skills since day one. Those thief skills in old school D and D do not count. For all intents and purposes, those are the rogue's class features. Yes. And as a bit of an aside, I always thought it was I always thought it was kind of dumb that their that their skill rolls are percentile rolls without anything to really justify it, especially since that's really the only time percentile rolls are used. I never saw. I never saw the point. I never saw the point in that when you can just do. You can just do it as a d20, since every number on a d20 is going to is going to be a is going to be five percent. So just do it in multiples of five. Uh, but 
dice, but rolls, but numbers. That's probably what it was. I, I'd like I'd like to think I'd like to, I'd like to think it was it's a ca it's a case of. Of art artifacts from artifacts from previous materials. I mean, because it did eventually sp it did uh, spring out of war gaming, and percentiles are used a little bit more in war gaming, so that could be true. Um, yes and no. It, re it really depends on the game, but this is but um, when I think when I think of a when I think of a game that is get that is going to be utilizing full on percentile dice. Um. D and D is the furthest thing from my mind. More often than not, I'm thinking of basic. I am thinking of dark heresy. Mm, I, to be quite honest, um, dark, I, I always found, I always found dark heresy and subsequent and subsequently um, Warhammer Fantasy Second to be a bit swingy. I mean, that's. I think that's intentional, though, Monk, because of uh, how swingy and unfair the world is to any PC. On one hand, I can understand that. On the other hand, flow theory exists. I know, I know. Uh, but again, we've uh, we've uh, on many other places in this channel, uh, we've held no love for uh, for bad design or for design oversight so you know pointing out the bad things with the good is always always rec recommended yeah now i did ask um i did ask Ta once again i did ask tanner his pr his particular take when it comes to doing the class fantasy of the rogue and and his issues with the rogue in vanilla and what what he had what he had said was i think my main issue with the rogue was similar to that of the Ranger. As is, it just didn't add very much to the party dynamic, and yet is an iconic class that didn't do much to interact with some of its more iconic elements. And, again, there are ways to build the Rogue into a multi-class setup where a few levels in it are really useful, but the core class, again, like the Ranger, didn't really fulfill the class fantasy for me. There are a lot of class features of the Rogue for 5e that I didn't mind, actually. Making sneak attack part of their normal damage rather than requiring flat-footed slash surprise was great, and I did like that it requires an ally near you because, hey, that's encouraging some party interaction, which I always like. But for the class fantasy aspect, um, 5e bards could generally do everything that rogues did, but better since they had spells to assist them. For the, for the class fantasy element, rogues get proficiency in every skill, and then tiers upon tiers of expertise on top of that. There isn't any skill that a rogue won't be competent in. For me, this is important to their class fantasy. If this is a magical world you're planning on scouting slash infiltrating slash thieving slash assassinating any of the archetypes associated with rogues, you're going to have to know how magic works, arcana. You're going to have to be physically fit, athletics, to be able to find hidden things or read those who might be trying to scam you, investigation, talk your way out of situations, persuasion, and know about the locations slash people slash items you're interacting with, history, to be able to find your way around slash know about biology slash different kinds of natural elements, nature, and sneak slash stealth slash disable locks and traps, skullduggery. A rogue who isn't able to do one of those things just doesn't make sense in the fantasy world to me, which is why they get what they get. On top of that, they are a wits class. They are about preparing for situations and knowing about them, so for, so for the party dynamic, having a rogue in your party means you will pretty much always know about what you are looking at, since a rogue is able to perform in every check that requires proficiency, and are able to react accordingly. On top of that, rogues get proficiency in any two artistries they want, and choose where to place their expertise tiers, so making rogues diverse in how they play, plus each of the archetypes focus on a different iconic aspect <coughs> of, of the larger rogue category. Um, I had also asked him how he f how he felt Rogue would work in the in the team emphasis, given that given that that's been a major factor with Heavens and Heresies so far. He had said, "So in the game, there's the thing called the proficiency check, a type of ability skill check that GMs are supposed to use for information slash things that couldn't be known or done without proficiency in the skill. 
These checks are relatively common for background information or general things that will aid the party in achieving their goals or give the party insight into a particular situation they are addressing. A lot of the time, the party will have holes in their proficiencies by design, and even if they don't, they still have to make the check. A rogue allows the party to effectively participate in every one of those checks with their tiers of expertise and skill-focused features. They also have a higher chance of succeeding them, making having a rogue in the party extremely helpful for addressing pretty much any type of situation. You know, for some reason, there's a song stuck in my head hearing all of that about the rogue. Ba 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 God damn it. For anyone who is too young to know this theme song, he can make anything with just some duct tape, wire, and a Swiss Army knife. His name is MacGyver. <sighs> oh, and chewing gum. Can't forget a little bit of chewing gum. Any, anyway, with the, with the, the I think the I think the important th- before before we really get into the opening quote I I I feel like di- I feel like digging into the play- into the old player's handbook and take and taking a look at the vanilla at the vanilla rogue and exactly what you end up getting. Oh, um, so let me. Let's see. Expertise, th- sneak attack, and thieves can't at first. Then cunning action. Then archetype. But uh, re- but re- but really, um, I mean, cun- cunning action is just a cunning action is just a bonus action. We've already mentioned sneak attack. Um, thieves ca- thieves can't is one is one of those things that. In my opinion, doesn't get all that much doesn't get all that much use because it's so it's so it's so narrative. It's almost too narrative, at least in the context of D and D. Well, it's too. I'd say it's too narrative, but but it's even it's even worse than that. It's one sided narrative. Yeah, only the thief knows it, and really, all they can do is initiate a check for it really that and the um, the gm the gm does the gm doesn't does ha, uh, it's putting it's putting faith that the gm is actually going to put that into use or that you're going to be in a situation where you're going to be where you're going to have that in use um you know how you know how you know how we've we talked we talked a while back about the ranger being very clearly designed for for for, for foresty type of, for um temperate forest type environments and not much else. Yes. You kind of have I I've always gotten that vibe when it comes to the when it comes to the rogue where it's very clear they're meant for urban environments and urban environments and po- and possibly dungeons but not mu- but not much in the way else. If they're outside of those two types of environments, they're um, a spare prick at the wedding. I mean, when it comes to a rogue, that's a little more literal. A spare prick at the wedding. <laughs> yeah, and cons- also consider consider the kinds of. The kinds of the kinds of popular ro- the kinds of popular rogues, in um, in fi- in fiction, yes, but also also in the case of video games, or the or characters that would fit the roguish archetype, like say, the early runs of Assassin's Creed, um, or Garrett from the Thief series, mm-hmm. um, yes, even yes, even Corvo from Dishonored. Although the, although that's pu- although that's pushing things quite a bit. Corvo's a spell sword assassin more than anything. Like I, like I said, it's very, it's very it's very much pushing it. Um, yeah, it's almost pr- <laughs> too specialized. Um, 
I don't. I'd. I probably. I'd probably bring up the. I'd probably bring up the prince from the Prince of Persia reboot. You mean from the two thousand eight reboot specifically? Um. Uh, yeah the re the reboot trilogy we all we all played as kids. Oh. Oh no, that one. Oh yeah. Mm. Um. What did you think cause... I meant? Did you think I meant Prince of Persia three D? Nobody played that. No, I thought I thought you meant uh, Prince of Persia with the colorful scarf uh, going around with the ghost lady. No, no, I like that game, but if I, but if I'm bringing up a Prince of Persia reboot, I'm thinking of the trilogy. So you're thinking of Yuri, Yuri Lowenthal? Got it. Yeah, yeah, I can go, I can go with that. But when it but when it comes to but the point is is that with all with all of them, while they certainly fit, while they certainly fit that. If you try, if you try and put those particular characters into the rogue archetype in D and D, no matter what edition, you're gonna end up running into problems, and in some cases, you're going to have to multi-class. Yeah, none of none of them can be just a straight rogue. Not a single one of the people you you mentioned. Even even Garrett doesn't doesn't really qualify as much. Yeah, because um, he's got a lot of skills that are. That the normal D and D rogue does not. Oh. He's the closest to the archetype, that's for sure. But, <sighs> but with with that said, would you do the honors when it comes to the when it comes to the opening quote for as, flavor? As always, as always, yes. Some people think that rogues are sneaky types, or cutthroats, or pickpockets. And, well, maybe they're right. We're that all right. We're that and so much more. See, most people don't give any thought about what it is to do those things we allegedly, and that's an important word because I haven't done anything, do. People think we use grappling hooks to climb, and maybe we do some of the time. But we don't have to do that. Cheap little ritual, and I'll just climb up through your window like a spider, allegedly. Allegedly. Or people think we sneak about around by moving quietly. Sure, we can move silently as the night itself. But what use is that to a rogue when he is, allegedly, breaking into a wizard's tower to get some high-quality magical goodies? Nothing. That's what it's worth. Stupid arcane eyes floating all about, seeing into everything and whatever. It doesn't matter how quietly you sneak, it's the wrong tool. And that's what we rogues are all about tools. More specifically, knowing the right tool for the job and being able to use it. Anti-divination magic for them pesky arcane eyes, for example. Now that's a tool. Or charring up a little itty bitty bit of disintegration powder or poison for impenetrable defenses. Now that's a tool. Or being able to see things that are invisible. Now that's a tool. Shoot, why spend an hour with a dinky lockpick when the door is barred by a magic seal? It doesn't work well. Why not just dispel the seal? Allegedly. Allegedly. Jesse the Alleged Thief. Three quarters Ling Rogue. Oh. Three, qu three quarters Ling Oh, I get it. You remember that one of the ancestries for Halfling was three quarters Ling, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it just it just dawned back on me. Um, so means he probably had a halfling mother and a full midget father. <laughs> or two different sets of halflings and a human. You're having way too much fun with this. I am. I was debating on whether I was going to give him an Irish accent or not. <laughs> I thought I thought the um, Weasley voice was going to be better for this with all the allegedly's in there. Yeah. Uh, so their core ability, their core ability requirements are dexterity and wits. So, the, so and when you use a when you make a skill or spell attack, you are going to be using your wits modifier for that attack. You gain proficiency with light armor, six weapon subcategories of your choice. You get simple proficiencies, which that's quite that's quite a bit. Um, 
You're proficient in dexterity and wits defenses. And two artistries of your choice. As well as... And then you're... Go ahead. And then you're proficient in all skills. Which means you get a tier of expertise in all skills, which you were already previously proficient. Especially since you're probably going to be getting some skill proficiencies from your ancestry. Yep. And then, of course, you know, any feats you might grab, any... You're just, you're just going to be that guy who does all the things. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see, you also learn four languages of your choice. Your, ba your base vitality is equal to half your level plus your wits modifier. So about the normal for everybody else, mm -hmm. in most cases. When you, cho when you choose this class, you gain three tier one weapons of your choice, two tier one potions or poisons of your choice, tier one light armor, and one adventuring kit of your choice. And then we get to raising the death flag. When a rogue raises the death flag, they're instantly restored to full HP. They gain resistance to all damage and conditions. Their movement, climb, and swim speeds increase by 15 feet. They have advantage on all attacks they make. Effects, ca effects cannot pose disadvantage on attacks they make. Their, the damage of their sneak attack feature increases by one dice type. And any attack they make which hits an enemy is considered to critically hit. Crit? What? You're auto critting. Yep. Which means if you if you use a sneak attack, you're auto critting on a sneak attack that is now one dice type higher than it was. Mm hmm. That's broken. <laughs> but it it does fit it does fit for a raising the death flag ability. I'm going to stab you over and over until you die. <laughs> That's gonna be right between your ribs in the same place, cutting all, right. all of the. All of the chest arteries, or a crossbow rogue saying, "I've got a, I've got a boat, I've got an arrow with your name on it, and I'm going to keep shooting until I find it." <laughs> Look, I really like the repeating crossbow from Van Helsing. Sue me. Of course you do. Um, let's see. So at first level, you start with your, you start with getting with getting your archetype, which the the um, vanilla rogue. I don't I don't think you did that. Let me check. Again. Let's see. Page. Yeah. Let's see, that would be page ninety four. No, I like the dev note. Nope. They don't get they don't get it till th in vanilla, they don't get it till third. True. I like the dev note here. Having problems with Rogue being a combination of four different archetypes? Well, fret no more. You get your archetype from the gate, and it'll help define what you can do and how you can do it. <laughs> I can't help but wonder if that's the reason why you're getting the ar the archetype right out of the gate. Well, we've seen one other class do that, remember? Yeah. And, w I think and it defines how that class works. Yep. That seem that seems to be the motif here. If if you're getting it right out of the gate, then your archetype is going to going going to more significantly define what define how it's going to work. Whereas if you get it at third level, it's going to it's going to add an extra layer. Yeah, it enhances the core. If it's gotten later, if it's gotten earlier, it is the core. Mm -hmm. So, again, I really like that. Um, that we have that sort of variance between classes. And also the fact that, you know, you're not waiting for three levels or two levels to get the part of your class that is, well, the flavor. Um, for, for Again, for the, the classes where you get the archetype later and it, and it enhances the core mechanic of that class, mm -hmm. that class is already plenty tasty without the uh, archetype. But the archetype is the hot sauce you add for that nice kick. Yep. Whereas this, this is your roux. This is this is your your uh, this is your sauce. This is your stock. Whatever you want to call it, depending on the cooking terms you you prefer, people. Hell, you could even say this is your filling if you're talking about desserts. Mm -hmm. Um, you get it immediately. You gotta have that core component immediately. And uh, I am all too. Happy 
to look forward to this. Yeah. So we'll obviously be getting to arch to archetypes later. Um, so next we have cunning. Your movement increases by five feet, and you may take the disengage or hide action as a ten foot quick action on your turn. <laughs> I'm gonna hide. Bye. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then you get sneak attack. Once per round, when you have advantage on an attack roll against an enemy, or when you make an attack against an enemy and an ally is within five feet of that enemy, you deal an additional 1d6 damage. This damage is of the same damage type as your weapon. At 5th level, this damage increases to 2d6. At 11th level, to 4d6. At, and at 17th level, to 6d6. And then, of course, if you raise the death flag at 17th level... It's 68. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing there are probably other class features that <laughs> increase yeah. the sneak attack die as well. This is not a, there is a dev note. Not as much damage as, as some other games, but damage on the whole has been reduced in, in Heavens and Heresies so that I can make more fun abilities that interact with the damage mechanic. And we've actually seen that as the um, vitality uh, tracks and the HP tracks from the Ancestries being, you know... You're not getting some of the obscene amounts of HP you could get in D&D. &D. Mm -hmm. Most of the tracks we saw, really, like, the highest ones capped out at, what, 90? Yeah. Around-ish theirs? Up in that level, and most of them were solidly in the 60-70 range once you got to level 20. Yeah. And so... Re and, re and really, the, um, the, the archetypes that are going to have that kind of, have that kind of level are going to be the, are going to be the tankiest of, de of the tank boys. Tanky, tanky, tanker tanks. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, at second level, you gain Initiator. You gain a bonus to your initiative equal to your proficiency bonus. At the beginning of a threatening encounter, before any creatures have acted, you may take a single action. Doing so does not count as a turn within the initiative order if initiative is being tracked. And then, of course, if initiative is not being tracked, where you just do the everybody takes turns in a row thing... Um, you you get to do an action before everybody else does uh, does actions, and you still get your other action in that whole grouping thing. Mm -hmm. Fun stuff. Yep. He's um. There's also a dev note. This feature is so cool to me. It adds so much to your, to not just to not just combat encounters, but other encounters as well. All the things that rogues are supposed to be able to do: traps, sudden changes of situations. This feature allows them to deal with them. Um. Although, given the f although what I couldn't help but notice is that the single action that they can take, it doesn't say that it can't be an attack. No, it's just an action. Mm -hmm. You could attack. You could set, you could place a trap. You could uh, there's a, a million and one things you can do with just that word action. And I'm almost guaranteeing that was intentional on Tanner's part because he, he wants you to be able to react in any way you can. So just just remember, Han shot first. I mean, if this thing has a smuggler archetype, I'm going to laugh. <laughs> um, af after that is bonus feet. You, get, uh, you gain a bonus feat, and you get an additional one at 5th, 11th, and 17th levels. And just like how action is not specified, neither is the feat type. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing this, again, is intentional, just because he wants the rogue to be able to be the guy who can reasonably do anything. Um... Clearly, the rogue here is a true jack of all trades, and maybe a master of one. Um, and so, being able to get any bonus feat from any of the of the feat lists, whether it's general feats or combat feats or anything like that, mm -hmm. is going to—or I should say, martial feats. Excuse me—is mm -hmm. um, is going to be uh, accessible to the rogue. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So. At third level, you gain Identify. You can use your action in order to identify an object or man-made location, such as an old crypt, an abandoned church, or abandoned dwarven tunnels. If you do, you learn any of the reputations of the target, if it has any, unless those reputations are hidden magically. If the target is a magical item, you learn its effects and any curses it may carry, unless those curses are hidden magically. And the dev note here is particularly nice. 
Like the Inquisitor with people, or the Ranger with natural locations, the Rogue is able to tell the reputations and effects of man-made locations like dungeons and objects, making them excel at the things they should excel at. Also, also it lets them know what things are actually valuable for stealing. Which, of course, if you're a rogue, that's, that's most important of all. But uh, again, again, allegedly stealing. <laughs> and remember, it's not stealing if you're taking it from a priceless tomb or some other abandoned area of, of human history. Then it's our favorite term of all. Treasure hunting. <laughs> oh. At fifth I'm... level, you gain expertise. You gain tier one expertise in two skills of your choice, which you get again at 10th, 15th, and 20th level. Oh, okay. I also like the flavor text. Being good at things is all a part of the job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you also gain uncanny dodge. Oh, geez, I remember having to deal with that shit. Um, when an, when an attacker that, that you can see hits you with an attack which specifically targets a physical defense, you can use your reaction in order to gain resistance to that attack's damage. At 13th level, you gain improved uncanny dodge. When an attacker you can see hits you with an attack, regardless of which defense it targets, you can use your reaction in order to gain resistance to that attack's damage. Nice. Nice and simple. Uh, mm-hmm. You get resistance if you spend your reaction. If you have a disciple who's giving you extra reactions, this is nice. Also, because of the fact that it's that we don't have to deal with any of that saving throw bullshit in this ca in this case, unlike say third edition dodge, this is actually useful. Indeed. Oh. Uh, and um. <laughs> Out of curiosity, I just went checking the Paladin Blessing effect table. Mm -hmm. uh, a Paladin's Blessing on a Rogue automatically promotes the sneak attack die to D8. So if you do and that the, and raise the death flag, then they're rolling D10s. Yeah, and then of course, uh, when the Paragon who gets boons from blessing people blesses the Rogue, they get plus three to their uh, deflection. Mm-hmm. I just, I wanted to go look at that again, and I'm like, ah, yeah, that's good. At 6th level, you gain Evasion, where you have resistance to damage from attacks that specifically target your Dexterity defense. With a dev note, rogues have a lot of defensive features. Why? Because you die alone in hev eh, because if you die alone in Heavens and Heresies, you are dead dead. Though, they're, these... So, these defensive features allow rogues to do things like scout ahead for the party or help fulfill the party's goals with a couple extra safeguards to ward off permadeath since there are no resurrection features in Heavens and Heresies. So yeah. Don't die alone. Dying alone is bad. At, at, at ninth level, you gain Reliable Talent. Whenever you would make an ability check and add proficiency with a skill in which you have expertise, instead of rolling the d20, you may treat your roll as an 8 plus your relevant ability modifier plus your skill proficiency, including your expertise. So if you, if you, if, oh man, starting at ninth level, if 8 plus, a, a plus your mod plus your proficiency would make the check, you can just go, reliable talent. That is fucking fantastic. Now, of course, you have to have expertise. Mm -hmm. But if you've been paying attention, people, not only do you get proficiency in every fucking skill and a, a feature that allows you to put, give yourself one tier of expertise in two skills at a time at 5th, 10th, 15th, and 20th, this, if, you're, if you're building your rogue to be as roguey as roguingly possible you're going to look for a way to spread around those expertises and get yourself as much expertise as possible early on. Mm -hmm. and I'm sure there's a way to do that if I play around with ancestries and backgrounds and everything else. Um, oh, yeah. 
And then at um, at twentieth level, you gain inef you gain ineffable. You gain one tier of expertise in your skills. <laughs> so at twentieth level, you just get one tier of expertise in every skill. Yeah, and let's let's not for let's not forget these tiers of expertise stack. Yep. Not to mention, at this level, you are also getting to choose two skills where you get to add one tier of expertise to anyway mm -hmm. from the previous ed edition. Yeah. Yep. You may give yourself advantage on an attack as a as a twenty foot quick action, which means you can make basically make any of your attacks if you haven't spent all your movement and have at least twenty feet of your movement left into a into a sneak attack. Mm -hmm. And increase each of your core abilities by two. If you would make an ability check with one of your core abilities ro and roll below your ability score for that ability, you may treat your ability score as the roll of the d20 instead. <laughs> so for for your dex, your wits, and whichever of the what your whatever your third core ability you chose was, they all increase by two. And if you are, for example, rolling a wits check. And your D twenty score is lower than your wits ability. You're just like, no, wits ability score is the is the role. <laughs> that's that's gross. Now I'm assuming here, I'm gonna I'm gonna make an assumption here that this does not supersede the auto fail or auto succeed of the die. I would like a clarification on that. Yeah. Because if you get, for example, Four, which is an auto fail. And you're like, no, I want to. I want to replace that with my wits, my wits ability score for the roll. Does that actually undo the auto fail? Because if so, that's actually kind of awesome, <laughs> and 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 it would make sense for a level, a twentieth level ability. But mm -hmm. let's let's not let's not beat around the bush here. This is a capstone. Yes. This is a capstone outside of the archetype. The archetypes have their own capstones. It is not um, just a capstone. This is an evolution of reliable talent. Yeah. Well, and a bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. um, this is... So, I, I want that clarification. Can this replace an auto-fail score? Because if it can, and I would be perfectly fine if it could, because, again, 20th level ability, it needs to be put in black and white so you don't have a rules lawyer. Well, those you, let, let's let's actually go beyond. This is a that guy, because only a that guy would say, "But the audio failed. The audio failed. The audio failed. It doesn't matter that he replaced it with his sixteen wits. The audio failed, because that guy has fun tormenting the table, and we yeah. tend to pile drive those people." Through a different table, mm -hmm. inside the squared, it's quite inside the squared circle. Is the table on fire? Your choice. I choose that the table. I choose that the table is on fire, and there and the and and um there and explosions are involved. In other words, it's a table <laughs> in an FMW match. Good choice. <laughs> uh so I was gonna go with either that or or the tape or the tables over over a bunch of piranhas, but that but that'd be a case where both people would get screwed. Yeah, we're we're pile driving this guy through a table on fire and and setting off explosions mm -hmm. because that guy is the, truly the guy who deserves such treatment. And then the last little part of ineffable is uh, the reputations of objects and man-made locations cannot be hidden magically from you. <laughs> What's that? You uh you 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 uh you wanted to hide the curse on this? I know how it's cursed. But how? I just do. <laughs> Jesus. So then we get then we get the roguish archetypes and um he did mention that he didn't have time to do the fl to do the flavor text, so it's going to be um, going to be going to be less serious flavor text. Starting with the assassin, stabby stab. Um, 
This may be me being a being a smartass, but it but um. But me, but maybe maybe as a bit of an in, maybe as a bit of an in joke, just write requiescat in pace uh, for the assassin's proper flavor text. <laughs> because that's the best version of Assassin's Creed. Thank you. Well, maybe Black Flag as well. I can never decide whether I like Assassin's Creed Two series or Black Flag better. <clears throat> I like. But I digress. Of, yeah. So. <sighs> At the start, you gain bo at the start you gain bonus proficiency. Not you gain one tier of expertise in either persuasion, investigation, or skullduggery. You also gain twist the knife. You may apply your sneak attack feature to an enemy that does not have an ally within five feet of it, even if you do not have advantage on the attack roll. <laughs> so assassins can literally just sneak attack all the time. Yes! <laughs> That's what that says. There's no ally within five feet, so normally I wouldn't be able to sneak attack because I don't have vantage. But I'm an assassin! Fuck you! Although this... Although... In, I was going to say, wouldn't, wouldn't, that make ineff, wouldn't that make ineffable kind of redundant, but not really. That wouldn't make ineffable and redundant because you could still give yourself advantage. That and um, ineffable still has a hefty cost with it, with a twenty foot quick action. Yes, not to mention the fact that ineffable is a twentieth level ability. Mm -hmm. So this is just I can sneak attack whenever the fuck I please. Thank you. Goodbye. Yep. At level one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, at third level, you gain exsanguination. I love that word. For anybody who wants a good vocabulary word, exsanguination is to draw blood until a person is dead. See, we give we give we, we give you the actual words instead of just throwing them around like we like we in in a way to pretend in a way to pretend that we're smart because we are because this is the monastery. This is not Adam Sessler. <laughs> anyway, Exsanguination. When you apply your sneak attack feature to an enemy, you may also infl you may also inflict two physical bleeding onto it. Interacts with the afflictions from other classes. Mm -hmm. Yay! Oh. Class synergy, everybody. It's there. I love the flavor text here. If the initial stab doesn't manage to bring him down, hopefully the the rapid loss of blood will. I mean, stab someone in the femoral artery and tell me if they're getting back up. <laughs> Death by exsanguination. Mm -hmm. Next is already dead. <laughs> yep, saw that coming. Roses are red. Violets are blue. Omaiwa. Omaiwa mo. For when you... For when you need someone to not know they've been stabbed until the right moment. You can delay the damage dealt by and conditions opposed by an, an attack until the beginning of the next round, approximately 10 seconds if initiative is not being counted. If you make this attack against an unaware enemy, you may make a skill attack against their wit's defense in order for your attack to escape their notice. If you make this attack against a target within a crowd, apply the results of your skill check to the target and the wits defense of the crowd, but still only make one roll. This literally is... <laughs> and then the guy explodes. This is literally Kenshiro. Yeah, it's... Although... Although... Give, although, um... I could... It's definitely filling the fulfilling the assassin fantasy with with what well, what with you um casually walking by some someone and then shanking them while no one notices. Stilettos are a really good assassination tool for a lot of reasons, mm -hmm. not the least of which being they are tiny and thin, and it's a good way to pierce someone's kidney. By the way, kids, don't go around stabbing each other in the kidney. That is bad, bad. Don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. Now, at seventh level, you gain in sheep's clothing, where wherein you gain proficiency in your intuition defense. 
If you already have proficiency in your intuition defense, you gain a proficiency in a defense of your choice instead. Oh, and you gain you also gain undetectable while motionless within an area that is hidden by darkness. You're additionally hidden by a severity equal to your wits modifier. Double hidden. Mm -hmm. And you're next. When you kill an enemy with your sneak attack feature, you may utilize a 10-foot quick action to threaten an enemy within 30 feet of you. Make a skill attack against the creature's resolve defense. On a hit, the creature is hindered by you until the end of its next turn by a severity equal to your wits modifier. And since you can sneak attack whenever the fuck you please! Shake! <laughs> and now it's your turn. <laughs> oh god, help me. At 11th, feet, 11th level, you gain nothing personal. Really? <laughs> really? What? No, wait, hold on. I'm gonna read the effect. If the distance to a creature is within your normal movement range, you can choose to teleport behind that creature rather than moving the total amount of space you teleport is subtracted from your movement <laughs> nothing personnel kid cold steel the hedge egg <laughs> i'm going to kick my fan i legitimately was tempted to kick my fan <laughs> Bravo, Tanner! You've made a meme class more meme than the way of the entering fist. <laughs> and this one's a serious class design. Yeah. We've already got Fist of the North Star and fucking Cold Steel the Hedgehog. But anyway, at 14th level, you gain All Alone. Attacks you make on creatures which do not have an ally within five feet of them are made with advantage. <laughs> now, is that creatures who do not have their allies within five feet of them? I th I think I think that's I think that's the intent. Because if it was your own allies, that wouldn't make all that much sense. Especially since it would then actually make one part of a uh, ineffable. Um, completely useless at that point so you so and let's not forget you can all because of the first level abilities that it's you can apply sneak attack to that which is going to be doing extra damage and bleeding yes yes um and at have your paladin have your paladin bless you just beforehand so it's d8s instead mm -hmm. and <laughs> at, at 18th level you gain inordinate exsanguination Whenever you apply the afflicted physical condition to an enemy, you apply a bonus severity of the effect equal to your wits modifier. So you'll apply two and then your wits mod. And assuming it, at level 18 you've been using, uh, you've, you've gotten your, your wits mod up to plus four, that's a six physical bleeding. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Jeez, and that's just the first one. <laughs> Thief's uh, thief's flavor uh, flavor text is takey take. So I am a dwarf and I dig a diggy hole. Diggy diggy hole, diggy diggy hole. Yes, this is what this is starting to sound like. Meanwhile, the child is laughing. The man is laughing. The boat is laughing. We kill the boat. Yes, welcome to Boat Murdered. Enjoy your stay. <laughs> uh, I, one of these days, I'm going to do a dramatic reading of Boat Murdered. And I'm probably not going to put it on YouTube. And Anyway, at first, le at first level, you gain bonus skill proficiency. You have one tier of expertise in a skill of your choice. And I love the nice. flavor text here. All thieves ha like different things, and you got to know what you like. If you don't, how are you going to steal it? Exactly. You also gain subtle strike. <laughs> this is another flavor text I like. Generally, people get pretty obstinate when they're shivved. It's best to hide that. When an ally hits a creature within your reach, with within your reach or range, with an attack, 
Interesting. You may aid your ally's strike as it lands and add the bonus damage from your sneak attack feature to their attack rather than your own. You do not need to make an attack roll. Doing so counts as using the feature for the round, and you may not use this feature if you have already dealt bonus damage from sneak attack this round. If the ally scores a critical hit, you may double the amount of damage dice you add from this feature to their attack. You must be conscious to use this feature, and it does not require you to utilize your reaction. Basically, I spend my sneak attack die on my friend. You Even if I'm... 60 feet away because I'm using a bow instead of a spear. Yeah, this is a, this is a case of giving very friendly fire. Well, the reason I say within your reach or range is because... It, or why I said with a bow and I'm 60 feet away is because it says or range. Mm -hmm. The ranged... If you're a ranged weapon user, and remember, you get simple proficiency in six fucking weapons of your choice! So... Uh... Oh, my buddy over there is about to hit that guy with a great sword real well. Hey, hey, buddy, buddy, there's an extra one d six damage. Or, assuming you're like fourteenth level, here's an extra four d six damage. Or four d eight if you've got the paladin involved. <laughs> if the paladin's blessed you, here's an extra four d eight damage. Mm -hmm. The guy now swinging the great sword, who might in fact be the paladin that just blessed you. Yeah. Looks at you and goes, thanks, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and now whatever he's hitting has turned into a big splat. Mm -hmm. So third, at third level, you gain probable deniability. <laughs> if, you, if you are to fail a dexterity skullduggery check to steal something from a creature, you have advantage on any ability persuasion check made to attempt to talk your way out of the situation. <laughs> I love... I, I like the uh, I like the flavor text. I mean, it doesn't matter if I'm the only one here. It could have been me, right? <laughs> you also gain Pilferer's Pouch. You gain a magical pouch to store your loot. This pouch is considered a personal item for you and does not have an encumbrance rating. Unlike a normal pouch, the mouth of it leads to a demiplane. It has a carrying capacity of 6, and only items with an encumbrance of 2 or less may be stored within the pouch. Removing an item from the pouch requires you to, to utilize a 10-foot quick action. The barrier between the demiplane and the material plane of the mouth of the bag prevents similar items, like bags of holding, from being placed within it, and likewise. It cannot be placed in those items. Spells cannot be cast inside the pilferer's pouch, nor can rituals be performed within it. This assumes that some, a, a, like a literal person can be put inside the pouch. Um, but it it's an encumbrance or two or less. So um, maybe we could put our favorite dragoon in the pouch. <laughs> She's certainly small enough. <laughs> <sighs> Let's see. At 7th level, you gain Slippery Mind. You gain proficiency to your Resolve Defense. If you already have proficiency in your Resolve Defense, you gain proficiency in a defense of your choice instead. So, mir mirroring what we saw with the Assassin. You also gain Fixating Strike. Well, he looks angry. When you use your subtle strike feature to aid an ally against a creature, you may make a skill attack against that creature's wit's defense. On a hit, all creatures other than your ally become hidden by, to the creature by a severity equal to your wit's modifier. This feature cannot stack with itself. So, now you're... G you're passing aggro. That's that's essentially what this is. If, you, this, if this were going to be compared to an MMO, you are passing aggro. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I like it. So, at 11th level, you gain unhindered. You are immune to the hindered condition unless its severity would, would surpass your wits modifier plus your proficiency modifier. 
And sorry, mate. <laughs> I like the flavor text here. But it's just like, you've got all that armor that you spent money on. I wouldn't want it to go to waste. When a creature would hit you with an attack which targets one of your physical defenses, you may expend one vitality and make the attack target a willing ally that is also a valid target for the attack instead of you. Damage dealt to an ally this way is reduced by your wits modifier. In addition, either you may apply your own resistances and damage re reductions to the damage, or your ally may apply theirs, but not both. Interesting. So you force the tank to tank. Oh, I mean, you force whoever's attacking you to, to tank for you. Mm-hmm. It's hiding behind the bigger guy so that he gets hit mm -hmm. by his by his comrades. Yep. Let's see. At 14th level, you gain deafness. Can do that. A and that. That too. Also that. You gain two tiers of expertise in Skullduggery. You increase your threat range by one and your movement by five feet. Nice. At, and at 18th level, you gain Inscrutable. Your thoughts can't be read by telepathy or other means unless you allow it. You can present false thoughts by succeeding on a skill attack against the creature's wit's defense. Additionally, no matter what you say, magic that would determine if you are telling the truth indicates you are being truthful if you so choose. You can't be compelled to tell the truth by magic and are immune to the effects of divination spells, i.e. you appear invisible to spells like Arcane Eye, and you are constantly hidden from creatures around you. The severity of that condition is equal to your wits modifier. Features that would allow a creature to ignore the severity of the hidden condition do not affect this feature. I'd like to point out that that one about telepathy and false, uh, false thoughts as well as telling the truth... Um, is the same things we read from the level 18 feature Etherhound for the Arbiter in uh, Inquisitor. Mm -hmm. At least parts of it. Yeah. Although the fact that you the fact that you are constant the fact that you are constantly hidden just means more opportunities for shanking. Yes. Because if you're hidden, something doesn't notice you. You get advantage on the attack, and thus now sneak attack damage. Mm -hmm. Of course, why would a good thief stab somebody when they can steal from them instead? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, the next the next one is the alchemist, which is interesting because so often alchemists are treated as their own class. But truth be told, boom, alchemist boom. being alchemist being a subclass of rogue actually makes sense here. The, the, the flavor text is boom boom which tells us everything <laughs> so demo man possibly so for, at first level you gain alchemical training you gain proficiency in alchemy if you're already proficient in this artistry you may gain proficiency in another artistry of your choice you may throw a drinkable potion at a willing ally in order to apply the effects of that potion to that ally. Doing so does not require an attack roll, but still requires your action. The range of the throw is the same as that of throwing poisons. Your throwing range for potions and poisons increases by 10 feet. Imagine throwing a healing... Imagine just, just fastballing a healing drought at one of your buddies. So you're Plague Knight. <laughs> I'm you, not wrong. No, you're not. And I just have the image of it of one of a he, of a healing potion that that's in a that's in a uh, gla that's in one that's in one of those gla that's in a glass vial to make it look like a sphere, and somebody just um just throw just throwing that like they're fastballing it. Yeah, that's a flask, monk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, flask. What, what the hell am I thinking? Um, brain. You also gain caustic strike. You may change your weapon damage type to poison or acid. When you hit an enemy with an attack that which utilizes your sneak attack feature, 
You may utilize a quick action 10 feet and apply the damage of your sneak attack to creatures within 5 feet of you that, that the attack roll would also hit. A creature cannot be hit by your sneak attack feature more than once in a single instance. I think... I think the intent splash is, sneak is attack spl damage? Yeah, is splash. So I, th I think that part about to creatures within five feet should be a little bit rewarded. Because I think the intent is is um is fi is is fi is five. I think it's I think it would be better served if it's five feet within the tar within the target of your sneak attack. Unless well, I I'm think he's, he's. I think what he's what he's basically saying is that your sneak attack damage splashes out from you, mm -hmm. and that's that's why it's within five feet of you. Yeah. Okay. That that makes sense then. Let's see, at third level, you gain added ingredients. So what if I experimented on myself to the point that I can't tell the difference between my blood and a vial of pure aetheric resonance? Resonance is resonance, right? You may expend a vitality when you are ch crafting a potion slash poison in order to choose one additional secondary effect for the potion slash poison. The resonance shares a quality with the base potion. When you do so, your maximum vitality total is reduced by one until that potion is used or consumed and you complete a rest. Dev note. So you know the mechanic of choosing secondary options for spells? The potion crafting in Heavens and Heresies is built on a similar but different enough to feel different but the same enough to not require syst more system mastery concept, allowing for a fun and customizable alchemy system. Interesting. Interesting. So you're so you're effectively you're effectively hot mixing. Like I said, plague night. <laughs> oh. Then we have unstable concoction. I mean, of course I'm going to throw it. It's going to explode. If you would throw a poison with an area of effect, you may apply your sneak attack damage to all creatures within the area of effect, and you may draw a stowed potion slash poison as a free action rather than a quick action on your turn. So you throw... You throw, you throw, you throw one, you throw one vial of alchemist fire, and then, and, and then immediately you've got the, you've got another one prepped for the next round. I like that idea. Let's see. At seventh level, you gain chemical tolerance. You gain proficiency in your Constitution defense and resistance to poison damage. If you already had resistance to poison damage, you gain immunity. If you already have proficiency in your constitution defense, you gain a proficiency in a defense of your choice instead. Plague Knight. See, next you gain Strange Toxins. Full disclosure, I don't remember printing that effect in there. When you use your Caustic Strike feature in an area around you, creatures also become afflicted with either poison or acid. The severity of this condition is equal to your Wits modifier. Splash sneak attack damage now also adding status effects. Mm -hmm. Of course. Um, you also at at this level gain quick potion. You may craft two potions during a period of drown time rather than one, provided you have the materials required for each. Combine that with spending two vitality to make these potions different rather than just one. I'd say I'd say I'd say the I'd say the alchemist and the ranger are going to get along great together. Mhm. Mm um at 11th level you gain fast hands. Once per turn you may throw a potion as a quick as a 15 foot quick action rather than an action. And once you've thrown it, you can you can draw another one so you can so in theory with this you could throw two potions at throw two potions in the same turn. Yep. And have an, and have another one re have, an, have another one ready for next round. Yep. So they, I'd imagine an alchemist just having just having a um a minor arsenal of di of different poisons and explosives. <laughs> 
Just imagine one getting a little bit um, loose with alchemist fire. Yeah. So, at 14th level, you gain Distracting Vapors. Whenever you hit a creature with your Caustic Strike feature, it becomes blinded. The severity of this condition is equal to your Wits modifier. I like the, the flavor text here. I think he's getting sleepy. Or maybe it's all the resonance in my blood giving me visions. One of the two. Mm -hmm. And at 18th level, you gain Potion Master. You may craft two identical potions by utilizing only one set of ingredients. And chemically induced paralysis. <laughs> okay, okay, I... I'll... Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I'll admit, I don't know if he's going to wake up. Ever. Whenever you hit a creature with your Caustic Strike feature, you may apply one severity of the stun condition on it as well. In addition, when you score a critical hit against a creature with your Caustic Strike feature, a severity of stun is applied as a wound. The, the severity of stun, sorry. Yeah, which means they get a, a wound version of stun. Oh. Remember, wounds are much harder to remove. Yep. And then... For the final archetype, we have the Spelunker. Its, uh, it's flavor text is Explore Explore. Now you're just getting redonkulous. Now it's getting redonkulous? The flavor text, yes. I repeat what I said. And I repeat my response. Anyway, we do have a dev note. While this archetype's features are all good and fulfill the archetype, a lot of the flavor texts are an inside joke, as was the name of the archetype initially. I'm going to keep them as is for the most part to see who can spot the joke. The archetype itself isn't a joke, though. It's pretty awesome. So at start, you gain bonus proficiency. Um... <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> God damn it, Tanner! You've been watching Batman Begins. The training is nothing. The will is everything. The will to act. You gain two tiers of expertise in the athletic skill. <laughs> bum, 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 bum. <laughs> you also gain debilitating strike. You may use your sneak attack feature against an enemy if you are making a weapon attack and there are no allies within 10 feet of you and the target of your attack, even if you do not have advantage on the attack roll. At third level, you gain Pathfinder. Your movement speed increases by 5 feet. And Hindrance. When you hit a creature with your sneak attack feature, you may apply one severity of the hindered condition to it. Oh boy. At 7th level, you gain strength chair. You gain strength training. You gain proficiency in your strength defense. If they are if you already have proficiency in your strength defense, you gain proficiency in a defense of your choice instead. You also gain maim. Whenever you hit a creature with your sneak attack feature, you may apply one severity of the weakened condition on it as well. You may not use this feature with your hindrance feature on the same attack if you, unless you do not have an ally within 10 feet of you. But if you don't have an ally within 10 feet of you, you can hit them with both! Mm -hmm. Helping Hand. You may perform the help as a quick action, the help action as a 15 foot quick action once per turn and may help a creature within 30 feet of you rather than one within your melee reach. Ray. At 11th level, you gain False Appearance. As long as you are surrounded by natural terrain, rocks, plants, trees, etc., you are hidden from creatures ar around you while you remain motionless. Creatures can, of course, notice that a bush was not there when they previously looked. This ability does not change your size or shape, and the severity of the condition is equal to your Wits modifier. At 14th level, you gain Unerring Eye. You gain one tier of expertise in Investigation, and your threat range increases by two. 
And Looks at, like he ran out of quotes to use. Yep, because <laughs> at 18th level, you gain Rending Strike, flavor text. Your maim and hindrance features now inflict a severity equal to your wits modifier rather than one. Nice. So, <laughs> I'd say, I'd say, um, when it comes when it comes to the de when it comes to the default rogue, um, it's definitely a case it's definitely a case of being able to do a little bit of everything. Which the th um. Whenever, whenever it comes, I've mentioned this in the past, but jack of all trades, jack of all trades, or even jack of many trades characters in fiction, are kind of tricky to put into a class system, simply because of the fact that people are supposed to be hyper focused on one thing over other things. Whereas this this class is hyper focused on being a jack of many things and master of one. Mm -hmm. There is a focus, but you still have all those extra tools. Yeah. It's just I'd say I'd say the key thing is go the key thing with the rogue is going to be adaptability. They are going to be the most adaptable class, yeah, um, of the ones we've seen so 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 far. Though I doubt the I doubt the other um, classes that we haven't gotten to yet will be will be at a, on a level of adaptable comparable. Well, that's because I believe the the last three classes we have are all casters. Mm-hmm. But, but even with that, I I do like how sneak attack works. I do I do like I do like that um that you can, the whole the whole take a I really like that whole take a single action at the at the start of a threatening encounter. Yeah, it's pretty nice. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm I'm not gonna lie. If I were gonna play a rogue, I'd be totally be going assassin. Which, speaking of that, since we've um, we've kind of, we've we've done a bit of analogy um, games when it comes to the when it comes to the um, archetypes, um, the assassin is. V I'm act I'm actually going to go one step further. the ass The assassin in this is Riki Maru. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> you might have to explain to the audience there, Monk. <laughs> Go play a Tenchu game. Except for Tenchu Z. Uh, I remember when the Tenchu games were good. Mm -hmm. I remember when the Tenchu games were still being made. Uh, just re just remember that... Um, don't... don't um, don't ex don't expect some of the things you may have taken for granted in other um, stealth games, especially the, especially the idea of it of it um ex of it highly sign highly um signposting in the UI whether your level of detection. No, all you have is all you have is just a set of, is just a set of symbols regarding key. Yep, Tenchu is very much about situational awareness. Mm-hmm. It is the stealth game that stealth masters play when they're tired of speed running, uh, <laughs> speed running the highest difficulties on MGS2. Or, do, or, uh, do, or do or doing a no kill run for the umpteenth time. Yep. Or if they, or if they, or if they want a stealth challenge, but they don't feel they don't feel like suffering through the thieves guild in the dark project again. Well, thief gold technically, but you get my point. Yep. No, I'm never going to shut up about how bad the thieves guild is. Because it chunks you into the sewers and keeps you there. Well, okay. Well, <laughs> it's not just that. It's the fact that it. It's the fast. It's the fact that there are. Layers and la there are floors upon floors upon floors, more so, more so than is really necessary, and th and the f and the fact that so that so many environments look way too samey. Mm-hmm. That that's why that's why the th that's why most people just recommend hitting using the level skip cheat just to skip the damn thing. Mm-hmm. 
Um, speaking of which, the thief obviously is is um is Garrett. I mean, yeah. Um, it's it's all it's all Garrett all the time here. Yep. The alchemist is Kang the Mad. I already said it was Plague Knight. <laughs> yeah, but I wanted to make a Jade Empire reference, so I'm going with Kang the Mad. Fine, but <laughs> it's still Plague Knight. Oh, it oh it certainly is. Probably probably more so because th be unless this alchemist makes things fly. Mm hmm. Oh. But yeah, it's de it is most de it is most definitely that. Oh. I was gonna I was gonna make the demo man joke, but it doesn't it doesn't hold as much weight as I thought it would. And the spelunker is fucking Batman. Bum 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 bum. One of these days we're gonna get ourselves in trouble with the Elfman estate. They can't sue me for doing my own rendition of it. That's actually fair use in this case. Oh yeah, there was that whole thing with the baby singing a prince song with that um that w that was a loss for the people suing. Yes. So um once again, a class I want to play. You know, if we do a playtest of this, I'm going to have an awful hard job. You are get you are going to be Homer Simpson going, "Don't make me choose." Probably. Probably. To be fair, I'm probably in, I'm going to be in the same camp. It's going to be even worse that once I've chosen my class, I'm not going to know which archetype to choose with most of them. If I choose rogue, it's assassin. <laughs> That's just it. I'm sorry. I want to be able to stabby stab everybody all the time. You want to be able to stabby stab so much that you stabby stab from a, from 30 feet away. I want to be able to stabby stab so much that I stabby stab the fabric of space and time. Oh. Which is, again, why nothing personal exists. <laughs> I still can't believe nothing that. Nothing personnel, kid. I still can't believe that was me. <laughs> what the fuck? No, it is Tanner being Tanner. We already yeah. know Tanner's a meme. Yeah. And we are the last people. We are the last people to talk, given some of our antics. I mean, again, our dwarf druid is a meme at this point. Mm. A meme for heavens and heresies. I wonder if he's ever going to imp import him into the Murari book. Um, I d I d I doubt it. But worst worst case worst case scenario, I'll um, I'll 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 ask the, I'll ask the guy who did the guy who did my who. I'll ask either the guy or the girl who've done who've done my avatars in the past if they if they'd be open to to doing to doing this dumb idea. I mean, if it works, is the idea dumb? No, if it's stupid, but it works, it's still stupid. And I get the I get the feeling that when it comes to when it comes to build wrong there, there, monk. Build, when it comes to building, uh, when it comes to building our crazy ass party, you are definitely, you are definitely going with ro we're we're definitely going with ro with rogue assassin. Um, our rogue assassin is a halfling who dresses who who dresses in the stereotypical edgy hoods, except they're in pastel colors because his mom has to buy them for him. <laughs> He's always quipping really, really cringy lines. But he gets the job done, so the party overlooks the fact that he's an annoying kid. Uh, you know, you know the ho the the hoodie thing. The hoodie thing is is way is way overdone. I I want this. I want an assassin that dresses like a Lanschnecht. You want an assassin that dresses in, like a Landschnecht, but Landschnecht wear medium armor, monk. Or they tend to wear scale or half. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm more referring to the to the gaudy, bright ass colors that they're known for. 
Um, I could see that one too. Be like, I'm gonna hit you, and you're not gonna be able to do anything about it. What? Stab. Either, either but, that or um, can we have can we have an can we have an assassin that's that's dressing more akin to a very colorful Zoro? But he wouldn't be acting like Zoro. That's the thing. <laughs> well, I would if we're gonna dress him colorful. I want it to be a Harlequin. Because, yes. <laughs> There we go, a Harlequin, and not those goddamn space knifier Harlequins. No, an actual Harlequin. The kind for the those kind, of you, the kind of thing that would be that would be in that would be in all manners of festivals in Paris. Or you know, you know, the boss from Devil May Cry Three. Oh God, Jester. Yeah, okay, yeah, this assassin is Jester, then. <laughs> like, just, just a teenage Jester. He's, so he's got a little bit of angst, but he's constantly quipping, and it's pretty cringy. And uh, when he stabs people, he laughs. When he doesn't stab people, he laughs. When people stab him, he laughs. And when he teleports, he laughs a lot. That way Dante can can accurately counter his pattern. <laughs> yeah. That uh, that it's that it certainly that certainly fit. Let's see let's see who we've got who we've got um in two weeks, because I won't be here next week to do this. Next week or rather not next week, in two in two weeks, we have the sorcerer. Alongside his horse. Horserer. You had to make that joke. Yes, I did. It was uh it was inevitable. Look, I spent way too much time go going through the going through the D and D out, out of context Tumblr page. I know. We've we, we've spent too much time going through many of the hilarious out of context and jokey pages of tabletop gaming. Yeah. Um. When it comes to the when it comes to the sorcerer, it's it's one of those classes that I I wish I wish I were a fly on the wall when it came to Skip Williams's infamous rant, so I could figure out what exactly it was that he despised about sorcerers. Now, obviously, I have I have no compunction. I mean, what I mean, the first the first anime that I physically bought with my own money involved sorcerers, and if any of you think it's sorcerer hunters, I am going to punch you. Repeatedly, yeah, but wouldn't wouldn't you say he's more akin to our assassin? Well, he well, st well, stabbers in that setting are basically magical assassins. So yeah. <laughs> um, just not as just not as much of an ed just not as much of an edge lord and with crazy eyes. For those of you who don't know what we're referencing, go look up Sorceress Stabber Orphan. <sighs> and 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 although if you're if you're if you're going to be looking at it, either go with either go with the first season of the of the 90 of the 97 anime, ignore season 2, or go or go with the or go with the more recent version from Studio Dean. In fact, you'd probably be better off going with that one since it's a lot more closer to the light novels. Yeah. Oh. Also, doesn't do, doesn't do the whole celery use as as much. <laughs> Look, cel well, celery use was a pro was a problem in the was a problem in the nineties. No getting around uh, it. I mean, it, it it was a problem not for any fault of the studios. Usually, it's just no. budgeting. Yeah, it's just it's just it's just but it's just a budget issue, it's, and gi given and to be fair, um, it's not the biggest offender when it comes to cell reuse. I will always say that the bi that the worst offender when it comes to reusing animations is the is Sailor Moon. I was about to start singing Moonlight Densets. <sighs> um, Rails though, Monk. Yes, but what I w what I what I will find interesting when we get to the sorcerer in two weeks is the fact that the sor 
the fact that the main appeal the main appeal with the sorcerer is supposed to be that they don't have to prepare sp they don't have to prepare spells. Now, granted, but, the f the, but they don't but they don't get the they don't get as many spells. Now, yeah. the five E version decided to give them meta magic and made all the wizards cry in the process. Good. And Heavens and Heresies doesn't have prepared spells, so we're going to see what they do with the secondary spell effect system and the spell casting uh, list. Yeah. It's cer it's certainly going to be interesting, but that's going to be in two weeks. As the, the reason why it's not going to be next week is I am in the process of of moving, so I am so aside so I am do so aside from one interview that interview that I have a couple of interviews that I have next week I am more I am more or less doing a work doing a work stoppage for the for, for the first week of November not work for my day job obviously but wor but a work stoppage regarding the regarding the monastery he's on the one hand you could say he's giving the monastery a holiday on the other hand you could say he's trying to get back at me and trying to torture me no, if I wanted to, if I believe me, if I wanted to, if I wanted to torture you, there are other me there are other methods. Yeah, but all of the methods that would torture me torture you too, monk. So it's kind of a fearic victory at there, or pyrrhic victory, excuse me. It's still a victory. Is it really though? <laughs> Plausible deniability. Yes. <laughs> Don't you remember, <laughs> anyway. remember from to the last I grapple with thee, from hell's heart I stab at thee, for hate's sake I spit my last breath at thee? I remember that. I just, you know, think that if I can avoid that, I will. I ha I am, you should know by now that I am infamously petty. No, no, it's not infamous at this point. It's downright infernally legendary. <laughs> it's ele well, it's not elevated. It's sunken below infamous. I can go I can go with that. <laughs> but with with all that said, we will see we will see you in two weeks when we cover the when we cover the sorcerer. And of and of course there'll be a f there'll be a few more surprises to come and I am pro I am probably going to need to break out the heavy liquor given what's coming Sunday, so <laughs> do, <laughs> do not pr do not pray for me, I'm far beyond that point. Instead, pray for his suffering. Uh, the ver well, if worse comes to worse, I can always borrow some liquor from Doku. Are you sure he hasn't drank it all by now? No. I am very <laughs> sure he has not drank it all by now. But with all that said, we'll, we will see you here in two weeks or 14 days, whichever comes first. But or, even a fort Go ahead. or even a fortnight. Oh, yeah. But not the video game. No, fuck that game. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>